Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Consciousness this month. You know, this is the third month that I've been doing this. I started it back in June. Um, and my, as you all well know by now, probably, if you're watching this, my idea was to pick a topic and record some stuff, uh, talking about it a little bit, and then have some guests on um, to further debate it. Uh, so back in June, it was conference month, and we talked about con the... Tucson versus the ASSC Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. And then um, in July, the uh, official topic was introspection and intentionality. And it's really hard to keep doing that because people's uh, schedules are very all over the place, you know. And so uh, some people are scheduled for other months and sometimes this month. And so I was really hard to kind of keep it all into uh, one sort of set area. So I'm, maybe I'm not going to be trying to do that as much, but uh, still I'm trying a little bit to do that. And so the, the theme that I wanted to talk about this month was attention, working memory, and phenomenological overflow. So these are some issues that have been very um, close to my heart uh, and and um, things that I've actually published on and, and care about uh, a lot. Now, obviously, there's been some overlap where we talked a little bit about attention uh, with some of my previous guests. Um, but attention is one of these things that seems like you know what it is until you start trying to say what it is, and then it's very difficult. So obviously there's kind of common sense metaphor um, uh, invoking a spotlight, the spotlight of attention, so that when we um, think about attention, it's like focusing in uh, on a, a subset of all of the information that's available to us. And... Um, uh, to the exclusion of that other information. And as we all know, there's two kinds of attention, at least two kinds. So there's exogenous and endogenous attention. So exo exogenous attention is attention that's somehow captured by something in the environment. So if you hear a loud sound, then you orient towards the sound. Um, that's sort of automatic. Your attention is captured by that. There's other phenomena as well um, where you get this kind of capturing effect. Um, so that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, but there's also what's called endogenous attention, which is where you internally direct your attention. So this is, you know, paradigm cases like when you're reading or something like that, I guess. Um, uh, you may tune out the sounds of the background. You're not paying attention to the sound of the running water or the dog pattering around or whatever. You're focused on what's happening on the page or in, in your mind is in response to the page. Um, and there, again, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to actually know what level to even pitch a theory at. So do we want to talk about it in terms of neural terms, in terms of psychological terms, the information processing? Um, those are important issues. Now, as it relates to consciousness specifically, there um, are a couple of questions in this area. So I think the simplest question is, is attention necessary for consciousness? So um, does it, does consciousness require that you attend to something? Or, or to put it differently, if you don't attend to something, are you not conscious of that? Um, so if there's no attention around, is there no consciousness? Um, uh, another question, that's the flip side of that, is the sufficiency question, which is, is attention sufficient for consciousness in that and whenever you're attending maybe in a certain way with some restrictions, let's, let's say, then you have consciousness, um, there, that there's uh, something that it's like for you when and only when there's attention. So um, there are people who think that you get a disassociation in both directions, so people who think that attention is not necessary, that you have consciousness in the absence of attention, um, and there are people who think that attention is consciousness, um, that that's just what consciousness is. It turns out to just be attending to something. And there are reasons for thinking this. You know, some of the interesting reasons maybe come from inattentional blindness, um, the famous gorilla walking across the stage e experiment comes to mind here. So the, in, in a case where you're being told to count how many times basketball players wearing a white shirt are passing the ball amongst themselves, and there's all these people moving around on the... Um, on the stage or the screen, and then the person in the gorilla suit walks by. This has uh, become quite popular. It's in commercials, and you can see it pretty much anywhere. Just Google uh, invisible gorilla, uh, and, and you'll find it. And so some people think that this supports the idea that consciousness is required for attention because here's a case where your attention is clearly being captured. Uh, your focus very clearly on where the ball is being passed amongst these players, and you just are not consciously aware of the gorilla as it walks by, or at least many people are not. Uh, some people are, 
uh, they spontaneously notice, notice it, and the idea is supposed to be, well, they were just attending, luckily, to where the gorilla was at that moment. But uh, if your attention is directed somewhere else, then whatever outside of attention is outside of conscious experience. So I think that's one reason that people have for thinking that attention is necessary for consciousness. Um, maybe even also for thinking that it's sufficient. I don't know. That may be a different issue. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who think, like I just said, that attention is sufficient for consciousness. So these people think that whenever you're attending in the right way, then that just is what we mean by consciousness. And there are people who think that, no, this is not the case, that there can be unconscious attention, attention um, are drawn to things outside of conscious experience. So there are some empirical results that seem to differentiate between these um, uh, uh I won't mention any of the results right now, but I am curious what the general, what's the common sense view? So I'm curious about what people who are listening to this think about the relationship between attention and consciousness. Um, now, closely related to that is working memory. So working memory is another one of these things where it seems like it makes perfect sense until you really try to give a theory of it. So working memory is, is supposed to be like an updated version of short-term memory. Um, it's it's uh, keeping information online for performing a task. So uh, the paradigm examples maybe trying to remember some digits, uh, maybe someone's password or um, a phone number. And so they tell you some digits, 786432, and you have to say 786432, 786432, 786432. So you're kind of rehearsing that in a loop, keeping it live in the mind uh, in order to do something with it, uh, like dial a number or enter a pin or something like that. And so working memory is, in the most general sense, is just keeping information online. And typically in neural terms, it's thought to correspond to, um, uh, it's a different kind of memory than long-term memory, which is that doesn't require activity of neurons. Uh, it's sort of encoded in the synapses, as far as we understand it. And uh, working memory does require the active maintenance of the information. Um, and uh, the prefrontal cortex is uh, associated very strongly with working memory. And so, uh, just as before, there are people who think that working, uh, being, ha being in working memory is necessary for a conscious experience. Um, and there are people who think that it's sufficient for conscious experience. Uh, so once again, there are all sorts of issues here. I, I think the global workspace theory of consciousness probably is um, one of the more recognizable theories that seems to um, equate conscious experience with the contents of working memory. Um, at least in some versions of it, it's, it's kind of hard actually to nail down what global workspace theorists actually think because there are actually different versions of the theory. <coughs> excuse me, which are all lumped together uh, often. Uh, but just as before, there's a question about whether there could be unconscious working memory. So that's something that I'm very interested in. Um, well, can there be unconscious working memory? Um, I think that the answer is yes. There are people who think that the answer is no. <coughs> there are people who think that the answer is no. So um, I want to talk to some of these people and get some skeptics and some uh, non-skeptics on here. But then there's just even a further question which is, um, is working memory an actual psychological kind? Is it something that will exist in our best theory of the mind when we have all the data in, or at least more of the data than we do now? So uh, there are people who are very skeptical about the, the, the very nature of working memory, that it is even a, a, a unitary kind of thing. And I want to bring some of those people on to talk about why they're skeptic, why they're skeptics about something which is um, appealed to all over the place in cognitive science and uh, get some of their arguments here. Now, both of these kinds of issues are related to the notion of phenomenological overflow. Uh, and again, this is one of those things where um, I, it seems like it makes sense. It, roughly, the idea is supposed to be that there's more in our conscious experience than we have access to. That's the kind of common sense way of, of putting what phenomenological overflow is, that we experience more than we can access at any given moment. Uh, it's closely associated with Ned Block and his work. Um, and, uh, you know, just by autobiographically, I can say that as an undergraduate, when I was coming into these debates, I was very convinced by by the, some kind of overflow that there was more in our conscious experience than that we accessed. 
And the, the kind of old classic examples like given by Bloch um, uh, sort of convinced me. So his, one of his classic examples was you're at, in your room, you're doing something, you're very intensely focused on writing or talking to someone, and then all of a sudden you notice that the jackhammer has been going on outside for 20 or 30 minutes, and it's just now um, that you're becoming aware of it, but you also are sort of aware that it's been there the whole time, um, that it's been there the entire time, and so, but earlier you weren't accessing it. Um, and that used to convince me and, and so I really tried to figure out well, what it would mean for there to be um, conscious experience that was unaccessed in this sense. And the more I tried to really figure out what it was, the more I really came to be aware that, well, gee, um, I can always sort of say what my conscious experience was in terms of what I was accessing and I don't really see that anything is left out. Um, so I can always uh, give a description of the case. And it doesn't seem that, um, that anything that's not there uh, really makes sense to call conscious if I am sort of completely and unaware of it. Um, and, and there are people, I mean, I'm, uh, I guess I'm not 100% convinced of this because it really depends on what you mean by access. So in Bloch's work, it's pretty clear that by access, what he means is working memory. So what he, I think, really wants to argue is that there is phenomenally conscious ex ex phenomenally conscious experience it's that things that are actually experienced which are outside of working memory and since working memory is the bottleneck that gives rise to report then these are things which you can't report on I think that's the way uh, Ned would like to put this stuff at least nowadays um, but there can also be other other kinds of overflow so you can does it overflow attention does it overflow any kind of cognitive access because while I might be okay with with saying that there's more in my conscious experience than can be accessed by working in, by working memory at any given moment. It's not clear to me that that entails that uh, there's more in my conscious experience than can be cognitively accessed at all. So this depends on what you mean by cognitive access. Um, and of course, uh, in my own work, I've uh, been somewhat sympathetic to the higher order thought theory of consciousness. And um, on that kind of theory, when you have a higher thought, you know, I'm in pain or I'm seeing red, um, I interpret that as a kind of cognitive access, a kind of access to, the, um, to, to one's own mental life. And if that's what you mean by access, then I don't think that we have a very good, uh, uh, any good reason actually to think that there is a phenomenally conscious, uh, why do I keep saying that, phenomenally conscious experience, a phenomenally experienced contents, um, which uh, overflow that kind of cognitive access. So I think that the issues here are somewhat tricky depending on how you define attention, how you define working memory, um, and how you define phenomenological overflow. Uh, so uh, in, in also just circling back around to the thing I was saying a second ago, I also think that the very notion that there is a kind of overflow uh, turns out to be somewhat mythical. Um, it, people often take it as a datum uh, that uh, people feel like they experience more than they can report or that they know about or I don't know depending on how you phrase it. But it's not clear to me that people really do think that. Um, so I wonder what you guys think. Uh, do you feel that you experience more than you can access? That there's more going on at any given moment than you can report on or uh, in some sense know about? Uh, I'm curious to think, see what you guys think. And uh, also, please stay tuned for some very interesting discussions coming up this month on these topics.